Yes, yes, fishing is a very relaxing hobby. And while fish are certainly an excellent source of protein, but as for putting any meat on your bones, well, I just don't know. Hi, I am Joe Alton, MD, also known as Dr. Bones, the disaster doc. And this is T.D. Bird, my good friend during most of my adult life. And this guy needs no introduction at all. Today I want to talk about the difference between wilderness medicine and long-term survival medicine. You know, I meet a lot of rugged outdoorsmen at the events that we speak at, and I always have to correct the same misconception that they all have, that wilderness medicine is the same as long-term survival medicine. I don't think it is. I don't claim to be a wilderness medicine expert, even if I am a member of the Wilderness Medical Society. I am just an old country doctor figuring out ways to get your family through a truly major disaster. There are medical strategies for short-term scenarios that are widely published and they're both reasonable and effective. An entire medical education system does exist to deal with limited wilderness or emergency situations, it's served by a growing industry of supplies and equipment. You can expect, not unreasonably, that the rescue helicopter is probably on the way, or will be relatively soon. What's your goal, however, when an emergency occurs in a remote setting? Well, the basic premise of wilderness, or just regular emergency medicine, is to evaluate the injured or ill patient, stabilize their condition, and transport that individual to the nearest modern hospital clinic or emergency care center. Now this series of steps makes perfect sense. You're not a physician and somewhere there are facilities that have a lot more technology than you have in your backpack. Your priority is to get the patient out of immediate danger and then ship them off. This will allow you to continue on your wilderness adventure and get that person taken care of. Now, transporting the injured person may be difficult to do, sometimes very difficult, but you still have the luxury of being able to pass the buck to those who have more knowledge, technology, supplies, and why not, you aren't a medical professional after all. Now, one day, however, there may come a time when a pandemic, civil unrest, a terrorist event may precipitate a situation where the miracle of modern medicine may just not be available. Indeed, not only not available, but even to the point that the potential for access to modern facilities no longer exists. We refer to this type of long-term scenario as a collapse. In a collapse, you will have more risk for illness and injury than on a hike in the woods, yet little or no hope of obtaining more advanced care than you yourself can provide. It's not a matter of a few days without modern technology, such as maybe after a hurricane or a tornado. Help is just plain old not coming. Therefore, you have become the place where the buck stops for the foreseeable future. Well, few people are really prepared to deal with the harsh reality of a long-term survival situation. To go even further, very few are willing to even entertain the possibility that such a tremendous burden might be placed upon them. Even for those stalwart men and women that are willing, there are few, if any, books that will consider this drastic turn of events. Here's one, the Survival Medicine Handbook by myself and my lovely partner, Nurse Amy. Sorry for the shameless plug. Yet the likelihood of your exposure to such a situation at some point in your life may not be so small. It stands to reason, therefore, that some medical education might be useful in times of trouble. Almost all handbooks and classes, some quite good, by the way, on wilderness or third world medicine will usually end with, and go to the hospital immediately, or and go to the doctor, get that person to the doctor. Now, although this is excellent advice for modern times, it won't be very helpful in an uncertain future when the hospitals might all be out of commission. You only have to look at Hurricane Katrina in 2005 to know that even modern medical facilities may be useless if they're understaffed, undersupplied, and overcrowded. Unwittingly, the majority of the citizens in New Orleans became their own medical care providers in the aftermath of the storm. With medical assistance teams overwhelmed, no one was coming to the aid of one injured or in ill individual when thousands of people needed help at once. Each household became the end of the line when it came to its own well-being. What if there was an EMP, an electromagnetic pulse, or other long-term disaster? Would you be ready if you were off the grid for good? 
If you become the end of the line with regards to the medical well-being of your family or group, there are certain adjustments that have to be made. Medical supplies have to be accumulated in quantity to deal with varied emergencies and you even have to consider things like dental emergencies. Medical knowledge has to be obtained, accessed, assimilated, and has to be shared. Sometimes that medic needs a medic. Get that knowledge by taking first responder or wilderness medicine courses, but then take this knowledge and adjust it to fit the mindset that you have to adopt in a collapse scenario. That things have changed for the long term and you are the sole medical resource when it comes to keeping your people healthy from beginning to end. Become medically self-reliant so that you'll keep it together even when everything else falls apart. We'll talk more in other videos about what it means to be a medical resource in times of trouble, and how to be an effective medic for your family or mutual assistance group in those circumstances. This is Joe Alton, MD, that old Dr. Bones, for Nurse Amy, TD Bird, and this guy wishing you good health, whether there are good times or bad. See you next week.